This episode of Trifles is made possible by listeners like you, who support us on Patreon and Substack. To learn more, go to patreon.com slash trifles or trifles.substack.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the problem was final, the house was empty, and his bow was last, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Why would the Pope engage Sherlock Holmes' services? Why did he receive the Legion of Honor from France? And why would he refuse a knighthood? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 371, Watson's Billiard Playing. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, are you ready to rack them and stack them? I'm, I'm <laughs> ready to chalk my cue and cue my chalk. And if I could only cue my chalk or talk my chalk into cueing, then I would be ready to sink something in somebody's pocket as long as it's not mine. All right. Well, rock chalk, as they say in Kansas. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the show notes for this episode are available in whatever app you happen to be listening to us on. Just check out the links and notes below. Uh, it'll, of course, take you to the SherlockHolmesPodcast.com website, which is where you can find our full stack of archives and uh, certainly the Patreon button if you'd like to support us. For as little as a dollar a month, we do appreciate that. Uh, you can sign up there to get email updates from us as well, so you don't miss a single Trifles episode. We've got uh, another wonderful show queued up for you here, so let's get right to it. Now, this particular trifling incident is related to a previous episode we did. We talked about billiards in episode 132. And I believe that was season three, if I'm not mistaken, where we were talking about games and sports in the canon. And we talked about the, the broad uh, applications or the broad mentions of billiards overall in the Sherlock Holmes stories. We talked a little bit about the history of the game. But in this case, we're inspired by an article by Don Jewell, in the Sherlock Holmes Journal from winter 1991. Now, the name Don Jewell may be familiar to you because Don was an inspiration behind um, some of the animals that we've talked about here on Trifles. He did a, a series of monographs called the, uh, was it the Natural History Series? Yes, yes. Of uh, Sherlock Holmes. And um, Sherlock Holmes Natural History Series. There you go. My, my memory did not fail me. And then in this case, Don had a really wonderful expose specifically about Watson's uh, instances of playing billiards and how Watson came to be a billiard player. And he, he gets into the history of billiards a little bit, which we're not going to repeat that. Um, but I thought it might be interesting for us to look at this angle specifically from Watson's perspective. Yes, absolutely. But my immediate question for you is, Have you ever? what's your own experience with billiards? Well, I've played pool. Can't mm. say that I've played billiards, though. So you've never played on a billiard table? No. Which is different from the eight, eight pocket. Yeah, I guess there are how many? Or six pocket, around? yeah. Six eight ball, ball, six pocket. Yeah. Eight ball, six pocket. Table, yeah, Those the, pockets, by the way, mark the difference between a gentleman and a fool. Uh, with a capital, 
<laughs> no, the gentleman and a bum with a capital B, and that rhymes with P. And, it and that starts with pool. Right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, well, right. uh, no, I have not played billiards. Uh, I played pool. I played bumper pool. Um, and I know we have a number of Sherlockians who do enjoy uh, the uh, the Q stick mm. uh, games of snooker and billiards and pool and whatnot, mm. but uh, have not played billiards. Yeah, I love. I used to love playing pool, and um, and I've played billiards. I've played on a billiard table sometime. I spent hours where I should have been studying when I was in college in the <laughs> student union playing. Particularly during psychology class, I remember, I found it much more soothing to play uh, play pool at the student union. I can understand that. Well, so did Watson. And uh, mm. Don uh, tells us that um, the uh, the game of pool in particular really came into its own in the 1890s as a you know, as as a public interest. Uh, the the game, excuse me, the book billiards was written by Major W. Broadfoot in 1896. And in that book, he reported that in the previous year, uh, excuse me, uh, 12 years previous to that, there had been one home that had a private billiard table. And as of the publication of the book in 1896, there were 20 Hmm. And the post office London directory for 1897 listed 30 billiard table manufacturers in London alone. And Burroughs and Watts was one of the firms also featured in the June issue of Strand, uh, the Strand magazine in 1895. So Watson could have read the article entitled How Games Are Made which alluded to the fact that production at the Burroughs and Watts plant was up to 700 tables per year. Hmm. Now, that's interesting because it's not clear to me that that statistic, I mean, this is just an observation, that that statistic is related to the popularity of the game as opposed to reflecting the rise of a more moneyed middle class. Hmm. Um, it, it would seem to me, and I, I have absolutely no idea or familiarity with how one would, pl- let's put it this way in, in, you know, America in the 20th century, you know, in, in my time, our time, um, you know, there were plenty of billiard parlors, some connected to bowling alleys and things like that, but it was, you know, not a, not a big deal to find a place to play bill to play pool, and in fact, some of the pool parlors actually had billiards tables. So, and they may still. I haven't I haven't been out to do that in a very long time, but I don't know how one went about playing pool, playing billiards, in Victorian England if you weren't a member of a club that had a table. Um, so I don't know how that worked as a commercial establishment. But it would seem to me that that statistic is more relevant to the rise of a moneyed class in which people had larger homes and a little bit more disposable income and an ability to invest in luxuries rather than a rise in popularity. But anyway, take that, you know, as as read, and let's say it is an indication of the rise in popularity. Don Jewell's piece here sort of all hinges on a sentence. And the sentence is in the first paragraph early in the beginning, and it's actually two sentences. He says, Little evidence exists in the canon, however, to suggest that Watson was either very clubbable or accomplished at playing billiards. And that's one sentence. And the next sentence is, While the game was especially suited to his temperament and physical abilities, now, that seems to me to be open for discussion. It was probably (laughs) not until his return to 221B Baker Street in 1896 that he began to play in earnest. Well, there's a word in that sentence that says probably. I'm a big fan of probably, but but how do we we infer that from the fact that... um, And then he goes on to say, you know, this was probably a great relief for Watson to escape from those quiet evenings by the fire with Mary, 
<laughs> so that instead he could go off by himself you know, and play with his pals. Well, we have an answer for you in Jules' mm. piece here. He says, from 1897 to 1899, references in Watson's notes to billiards and billiard rooms seem to pop up everywhere mm. in the Abbey Grange. He recorded how Lady Brackenstall claimed to check the billiard room to see that all was well before going to bed. Mm. In uh, The Missing Three Quarter, Cyril mm -hmm. Overton's description of Lord Mount James, I'll always remember this, he was stricken with gout to the point of chalking his <laughs> billiard cue with his knuckles. Yeah. Uh, on the first, but, the first night yeah, in Baskerville Hall, Watson confessed to being glad when the meal was over so he and Sir Henry could retire to the modern billiard room. Yeah. Well, but as Holmes' practice builds up steam, you know, they're in places where, among other things, there are billiard tables. That's not necessarily connected to the fact that Beginning in 1896, Watson began to play in earnest. But anyway, you know, I mean, let's, you know, we can slide over that and sort of take that as well. Well, this is, the, the, he, he addresses that as well. This is, um, you know, he, he uh, suffered the, the death of his wife just before mm -hmm. Holmes returned in 1894. And then in 1896, he took up residence with Holmes back in Baker Street. And shortly thereafter, references to billiards began. Obviously, without wife or friend, Watson sought comfort in the smoke-filled billiard room of his club by the time he rejoined Holmes. And the, this night out with the boys had already become routine. Mm. Well, now that is, that is really more than passingly logical. I'll have to give Don Jewell that. I think that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's well, well done. Yeah. So, um, but, he, but he wonders, why did Watson take so long to pick up the cue? Mm. Uh, in his youth, he, he was, you know, more physical, rugby, and, uh, of course, cricket, applying the, the cricket bat to Tadpole, tadpole Phelps. Um, and he said that could hardly have blossomed in a billiard hall. Um, no doubt no, the game attracted his attention when he returned to London after being invalided out of Afghanistan. Yeah. His injury may have prevented him from standing around a billiard table, but there was his practice, which wasn't absorbing, took him to, uh, took up a bit of his time, he had his wife to consider, you know, so there were these distractions that kept Watson from it <laughs> until later on. Well, but there's great... You know, it's almost like physical therapy, playing mm. billiards, you know, with you, which, which if you've got sort of a leg issue, you know, stretching and gentle, I would think it wouldn't be. Yeah, but it's uh, a problem if you have a shoulder issue. Oh, well, no, that's a very good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. But here's the thing. We know Watson was a betting man. And yeah. What yeah. better opportunity to combine this light physical activity with gambling? Hmm. So, um, mm. interestingly enough, um, Don references a historical point in uh, the Red-Headed League. Watson and Holmes went to St. James's Hall to hear Sarasate on the violin, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, well, in the 1897 Whitaker's Almanac, there were real money matches uh, where... Uh, Let's see. There was a there was a spectacle at St. James's Hall, uh, specifically for like billiards. billiards. Yeah. yeah, February eleventh, eighteen seventy. There it is. Yeah, yeah. The Prince of Wales was even there <laughs> because by by eighteen ninety seven, money matches had kind of gone the way of the dodo. But there there had been a historical uh, example of billiards. Uh, kind of an exhibition there, a money game. <laughs> and people go to watch. See, it's quite a nice description here from the Sporting Magazine. Every seat was occupied, the writer says, and the galleries themselves accommodated a very large number of spectators, many of whom had provided themselves with opera glasses. <laughs> a new concomitant to a billiard match, but a very necessary one on this occasion. Shortly after eight o'clock, the calls of time 
became very loud and impatient, and with a view to creating a diversion, someone who appeared to have the chief management of the affair began to weigh the balls. He spun out this operation in very clever fashion and kept the people quiet for nearly ten minutes. <laughs> but, it, but at last they grew tired at seeing him hold up the scales <laughs> and remain immovable, apparently wrapped in astonishment that the balls should exactly balance each other. <laughs> and the noise became worse than ever. At length, the two men appeared without their coats and apparently <laughs> eager for the fray, and they were received with uproarious applause. Now, isn't that hysterical, the idea that maybe that is done? I've never seen that before, but the idea that a billiard match, someone would come out and then demonstrate for the audience ball by ball, with a little scale, to show that they're exactly the same weight. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about the theater of it, right? I guess uh, so. Now when there's money involved, you certainly want to so. be careful. But, but can you imagine the background there, you know, about oh, a couple hours before the match? Dave says, Ted, where's the billiard scale? <laughs> and Ted says, what? Billiard so, scale? What are you talking about? There are no scale. He says, no, no, what we use to weigh the balls. Oh, right, right. Well, I was using that, just I was using the, the that to scale. weigh envelopes. <laughs> I was using that to weigh envelopes exactly. a few hours ago. One of those little two-ounce weights. I had it here. Hold on a moment. Oh. <laughs> just hop over to Covent Garden and pick up some scales over there, will you? Yeah, geez, please. So, uh... <laughs> When, when we do hear about Watson specifically playing pool, mm. uh, we know that uh, Holmes observed in The Dancing Men that uh, Watson was just back from his club playing billiards with Thurston. And, you know, there, there was this whole deduction about seeing chalk marks and asking for his checkbook. And, uh, you know, he had... Uh, he had... Uh, uh, Thurston had asked Watson to invest in South African securities, and uh, <laughs> so Holmes decided uh, that he wasn't uh, taking Thurston up on that offer, but that he was playing billiards. Mm. Well, and then Don gets into a really brilliant little bit, I think, a very fancy and interesting little bit here about this question, this perennial question that we've worried about for years, Sherlockians, who was Thurston? <laughs> well, Don says 16 Thurstons were listed in the post office directory for 1897. There was a brace and belt manufacturer, a leather seller, a piano forte string maker, a grocer cheesemonger, a hatter umbrella maker. However, oh, and there was a Daniel Thurston, a surgeon living at Euston Road. Huh. Uh, on the other hand, the person concerned could have been Charles Omega Thurston or John Penrose Thurston, which both both of whom operated public houses where Watson was perhaps ah. too too frequent too frequent a patron. Now that's but then, funny. But then he gets to you know a real link here between Thurston and billiards. Yeah, he says, um, was Thurston the name of a real person, or was it? Uh a, a name invented by Watson to protect the privacy of a friend. And he, he said, here's where Watson's pawky humor comes through. Thurston and Company, established in 1814, were well-known billiard table manufacturers by sole appointment to Her Majesty the Queen. The founder of the firm had invented the slate table. Now, if Watson played on one of their tables, could it not justifiably said that he played with Thurston? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah. It is nice. And then, it, then he says something that I didn't know. He says, Conan Doyle was a frequent caller at the company's rooms in Catherine Street and later in Leicester Square. Now, I gather when he says the company's rooms, mm -hmm. that... And being a frequent caller, I mean, Arthur Conan Doyle is not frequently going to a billiard table manufacturer. Apparently, you could play there, apparently. Yeah. Well, that's that's a handy way of doing uh, product demos. <laughs> I like that. 
Well, he also says just because Watson played billiards with Thurston doesn't mean that he always played at his club. Mm. You know, they could have met up in other places. Uh, Bedeker's Guide uh, for 1898 advised visitors uh, to the city that uh, billiard tables could be found pretty much anywhere uh, you could find a hotel or a large restaurant or public house. And the usual oh. charge was a shilling an hour or a shilling oh, and sixpence if you wanted to play billiards by artificial light. Yeah, well, you got to pay for the electricity. Right. Oh, so there you are. So, um, you know, there were plenty of opportunities for just about anybody to play. Um, most likely, if you were a man, I doubt, I imagine you'd have a number of issues if you were a woman. Mm. And the more popular of the billiard rooms were operated by professional players. So people who had a reputation for their professional skill playing the game, like Cook, Thompson, Roberts, Cox, Bennett, and Peel, operated apparently their own billiard rooms. So you could go over and, uh, you know, play in an establishment that's linked to a professional. That's interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, just to kind of finish this up with a, an incredibly trifling uh, item. Um, <laughs> we're we're going to talk a little bit about chalk here. Now, Watson, of course, this is part of the deduction that Holmes made in The Dancing Men. Watson placed uh, chalk between his left thumb and index finger to steady the cue stick when he made his shots. Now, white chalk would have come either from square blocks done up in green paper or cylindrical pieces in cardboard cases. And the latter type was turned straight out of a solid block, so wasn't free from grit and impurities. But there was also the new greenish-blue St. Martin's chalk, which had been <laughs> recently marketed by a French firm. Uh, th this did not make as much mess as the white chalk, but it was expensive. <laughs> so, if only Holmes had mentioned what color chalk was on Watson's hand. Yeah. Well, that would have been interesting, you know. Watson, I see you've been playing over at the Savage Club, where they favor the St. Martins. Because, of course, Holmes would have written a, a monograph. monograph. <laughs> <laughs> a monograph on the six types of chalk, That's where exactly they can be right. found around the environs of London. That's right. But uh, even that, if such a monograph had existed... That would have been only a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. You had chalk between your forefinger and thumb when you returned from the club last night. You put chalk there when you play billiards to ease the cue. You never play billiards except with Thurston. <laughs>